let's move on to uh, the third talk of our session, um, which is going to be uh, delivered by Maria Chekova um, of uh, the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light uh, in Erlangen. Um, uh, Professor Chekova is going to be telling us about bright twin beams for quantum imaging and metrology. Um, please take it away. Thank you, Josh. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank the Big Quick people for in inviting me and for um, organizing this event. It is uh, really very well organized. I, I, I really enjoy how accurately everything happens. Well, I would like to say that I will be very happy to meet all you again in person. <laughs> I hope it finishes at some point. <laughs> right, so yeah. Uh, wait, I have to, I have to share my screen. Uh, that's it, I believe. Yeah. Okay, so do you see my screen? Yeah. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about a bright twin beams obtained by parametric down conversion. And um, I would like to talk about their application for uh, quantum metrology mainly. Quantum imaging I will mention, but just a little bit. And uh, yes, I am from Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light in Erlangen, but this work uh, has been done mostly in collaboration with the Ottawa people. That's Max Planck uh, University of Ottawa Center or Extreme Photonics uh, Group in Ottawa. Um, so, let me give, yeah. Uh, so this is um, just some short introduction. Of course, uh, most of you know what is uh, parametric down conversion, but most of you know parametric down conversion is a source of entangled photons. Uh, and uh, this is really what happens when we pump a second order nonlinear crystal and we generate signal and either photons. These photons uh, appear sort of at the same time and sort of at the same point, not exactly at the same point at the same time, but um, roughly. Um, and therefore they have uh, entanglement in uh, time, in space, and also in frequency because their frequencies are correlated. Uh, and then the angles in, of emission are correlated. Uh, so there is entanglement in um, uh, wave vector. However, uh, a little bit less known is what happens when we pump strongly this same nonlinear crystal. Then signal and idler come in so many pairs that uh, you cannot speak about pairs anymore. There are the, these bright twin beams, or uh, sometimes they, uh, they can uh, propagate as a single beam. They can have uh, the same frequency, the same direction, and then it's a uh, degenerate case. Uh, this state of light is very bright. When I say bright, I mean number of photons per mode. I will be using this uh, term many times in my talk. Number of photons per mode basically means number of photons in, within a coherence volume. So per, per coherence time, per coherence uh, volume. And um, so the number of photons per mode is very large. And these beams look like laser beams, I will show you. And then they have a uh, perfect, uh, I put it in quotes, uh, because uh, of course nothing is perfect, but rather good photon number correlation. So the numbers in signal and other beams are the same. And uh, in principle, they feature also a quadrature squeezing if they are emitted uh, into a single beam. Uh, this is the plan of my talk. I will first uh, talk uh, a little bit more about these bright twin beams. And then I will introduce two new works we did uh, both together with Ottawa people. One is on metrology, and that's a calibration of a spectrometer, which can be um, which can be generalized to the calibration of any spectral device. And then finally, a very recent work is how we generate these beams efficiently and even with suppressed noise. And this is, I think, useful for uh, all applications I will mention. Okay, so again, we strongly pump this nonlinear crystal. We generate signal and other beams. So this is a picture that is not photoshopped. So this is the picture of bright PDC rings uh, on a paper screen uh, reflecting in the optical table. Uh, I really like this picture. Um, and uh, this is a video also uh, that shows how one can 
um, see a strong emission in one of the beams, uh, for instance, in the visible beam, the other is infrared, it's somewhere here, um, not, not, uh, not visible. Um, but by uh, tilting the crystal, we can change the phase matching. And actually this video is uh, taken in the case where due to the strong spatial walk-off effect, there is preferable generation along the pointing vector inside the crystal. In a, in a long crystal, there will be very visible spatial walk-off effect and one of the beams will be uh, really strongly um, enhanced and its twin, of course, will be enhanced as well. Uh, because, because they are always generated in, uh, in, in, in pairs. Uh, so uh, I, will, I will probably uh, start the uh, video again, just, just to uh, let it play when, it's, when I'm speaking. Uh, meanwhile, the mean number of photons in these twin beams is given by this simple relation, uh, hyperbolic uh, sine squared of what we call parametric gain, this G, is uh, proportional to the second order susceptibility to the pump amplitude and to the length of the material. And we can easily make it uh, high. Uh, so for instance, this is an example, a very old example where we made this gain um, reach uh, 16 by increasing the pump power. Uh, and uh, this is how this gain can be measured by measuring the output of the at the nonlinear crystal versus the pump power and by fitting this dependence. Um, and uh, so these beams, as you see, can be very bright because if you take this cinch squared of uh, 16, it will be it will be a lot. It will be like a laser uh, brightness. And uh, what is non-classical about these beams? Well, a part of the quadrature squeezing, which I will not discuss today, although we did measure it, uh, it is very relatively easy uh, to measure so-called twin beam squeezing or photon number correlations. It's, it's a very simple thing, is that because the emission is always in pairs, uh, there is always the same number of signal photon, photons and idler photons. If somehow we can uh, split them, uh, deterministically, I mean, uh, not not on a 50-50 beam splitter, but uh, using the uh, wave, different wavelengths or, for instance, different angles of emission, then uh, it's it's convenient to introduce this so-called noise reduction factor, and this is the variance of the difference of the photon numbers in signal and idler beams normalized to its mean sum, and this noise reduction factor uh, originally it's zero. Uh, well. If there, are, if there is no loss, it is zero, but actually it becomes non-zero due to loss and only due to loss or imperfect detection, but typically it's much less than one. And here are some old results. I, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm showing really, really old uh, results of our group of where we measured this noise reduction factor versus the mean number of photons per mole. But I want to stress a very typical tendency that the brighter the beams, the larger the number of photons per mold, the worse this twin beam squeezing. At some, at some point, uh, it becomes uh, not non-classical anymore. It's non-classical when this NRF is less than one. And here, uh, for instance, in this red curve, re red line, you see that very quickly, already at 200 photons per mold, uh, the, the condition is not, not, not satisfied anymore. Um, well, recently, uh, rather recently, we improved this result and we achieved the noise reduction um, of about 0.16, which is equivalent to almost 8 dB twin beam squeezing. And, uh, but still, there is an interesting thing. Uh, this graph shows both number of photons per mode, that's the uh, lower uh, axis, and the number of photons per pulse. And although the number of photons per pulse was high, like 10 to the 5, the number of photons per mode was very small. And only for this small number of photons per mode, this line, uh, please ignore the other points, uh, the, the, the orange and blue and red points, these are only these points that matter, uh, we were able to have this uh, good squeezing. So this is because the reason for this behavior at large uh, numbers of photons per mode is that, at, is that the statistics of each of the beams is actually thermal. So a single mode has a thermal statistics. And thermal statistics means huge photon number fluctuations, not Poissonian at all, like 
the variance is uh, quadratic in the mean for the number. And that's why when the mean number of films per mode is large, these fluctuations are so strong that they prevent, uh, prevent one from measuring these uh, nice uh, correlations uh, because uh, you, you always detect wrong modes. Nothing is perfect. You can never detect only uh, proper modes, only matching. So these are matching modes um, cause this uh, effect. Um, okay, so just just short what this photon number um, correlations mean, and actually it's entanglement. Just uh, you can imagine that the source emits random numbers of photons at at each time, uh, but but the numbers of photons in beam A is the same as the number of photons in beam B, and this can be even uh, quantified like entanglement because the state is uh, for a single mode, of course, is given by this. Uh, Fox state expansion in modes A and B. Um, and then uh, these coefficients uh, C decay so slowly that it, it is equivalent to a high degree of photon number entanglement. Some time ago, we even uh, published some theory paper on the different calculating different measures of entanglement, log negativity, Schmidt number, Federer ratio, and so on. Um, and this kind of photon number entanglement or correlations was used in this uh, work uh, by Marco Genovese group. Uh, now it's, it's fashionable to say pioneering. So yeah, that, that was the pioneering work where they use this photon number correlations to image um, a very small object, which was a um, pi uh, character uh, placed in one of the beams, uh, one of the twin beams. And then they did the subtraction of the images and because this subtraction um, has noise uh, reduced due to this noise reduction that I just discussed, then this P character was visible much better than in the case of uh, simple classical imaging and uh, differential uh, classical imaging. So this quantum image was better. And, and this work uh, was, was later um, developed uh, in, in Bristol as well, so I don't have time to mention uh, these very nice results by, uh, by Jonathan Matthews' group, uh, but uh, the idea is, is, is clear. So to do this imaging, you need uh, the twin beams, the correlations, you need them to be multimode, but you don't want to have fluctuations. Actually, this, uh, group by the two, uh, this, this work by the Turing group was made under very weak uh, and a very small photon number per mole. The photon number per pulse was large, but per mole it was small. And now I'm going to uh, change the gears a little bit. So I'm going to speak about the calibration of spectral devices that we did recently. And the idea is very simple. It, it is even not about correlations. It's about the fact that for parametric down conversion, and I believe the same would be for poly mixing, that the number of photons uh, per mode at low parametric gain uh, depends on the frequency in a very simple fashion, because it depends uh, just on the frequency chosen for the signal beam, for instance, uh, the product uh, with the idler frequency, so this is omega pump minus omega is the idler frequency, and it gives us a parabola. And the rest are just constants. So the pump amplitude, the length of the crystal, and chi 2 uh, the, sus the susceptibility, which has, of course, dispersion, which depends on frequency, but it depends on frequency very slowly if uh, you work in the transparency range. And so this number of photons as a function of frequency is given by a parabola. And then if you uh, register a spectrum, the shape of your spectrum uh, depends just on the, uh, on the sensitivity of the spectrometer. And some time ago, we noticed this and we calibrated our spectrometer uh, this way. So we tuned the crystal so that signal and idler beams, uh, signal and idler frequencies were separated by, were, were, were tuned yeah, uh, over frequency. And the peaks of these curves should basically lie on this, on the parabola. And knowing this, we uh, calibrated our spectrometer that was published in the supplementary of our paper. <laughs> we have a tendency to publish interesting things in the supplementaries. I'm working on this, but it <laughs> seems to persist. And then later we did this work with Ottawa Group on a better basis, on a more um, accurate basis. 
so there was again a parametric down conversion source. It was tunable uh, by, by just uh, tilting the crystal. And then uh, we, we had a spectrometer and the CCD camera at output. And this is the result. So this is uh, what happens when the crystal is tuned. Uh, the signal and other peaks uh, move and uh, taking the maximum values, uh, we, can, uh, we can obtain the sensitivity curve of the spectrometer and we even compared it with the result obtained with the reference lamp and they agreed to a rather good extent. Um, and then another thing, probably much more interesting is that at high gain, when we increase the pumping uh, strength, pumping power, then now this parabola determines the gain, the g of omega, and then everything becomes nonlinear. As I showed you, the number of photons uh, scales nonlinearly with the pump power and with the gain in this uh, cinch squared fashion, and then the parabola becomes more pronounced. And the way the parabola is pronounced uh, tells you actually the real number of photons. And this uh, helped uh, helped us to find the absolute number of sensitivity, not just the relative uh, sensitivity curve of the spectrometer, but to calibrate this camera. It was not very precise, so we, we got about 10% efficiency, but still I believe it's, it's quite interesting, and uh, compared to the specs, we got a uh, rather good agreement. However, there are still two problems with the twin beams. One I mentioned already, here I show that uh, each of the twin beams has very strong thermal fluctuations. The intensity, here I show, for instance, the probability distribution of the intensity, uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this is the thermal distribution. This is what happens for each beam taken separately, and this is what happens when they are emitted into a single mode. This is even worse. So very slow decay of the intensity probability distribution. And it means uh, that the variance is quadratic in the number of photons. It means very high intensity fluctuations. And these fluctuations, of course, spoil uh, everything. Uh, another problem is that uh, we use very powerful laser to excite this parametric down conversion. We need, uh, in the previous experiments, what I showed, uh, the mean power was some tens of milliwatts. And uh, the peak power was about eight orders of magnitude higher because of the low duty cycle of the lasers that we use. We use picosecond lasers typically with kilohertz rate. Uh, but it seems that there is a way out. And the way out uh, was shown, um, we, we are just, just working on it. It's our uh, ongoing experiment, just uh, something published on the archive. Uh, so what we did, we just used lithium navit, and although we don't uh, use these uh, nice waveguides uh, Christina was talking about, um, just the just, uh, bulk periodically pulled lithium navit long enough, five millimeters, and pumped with picosecond pulses, that's important, uh, six picosecond, that's enough not to have a strong um, temporal walk-off inside the crystal so that the signal and either pulses do not walk off from each other and from the pump. We focused tightly, rather tightly, into these uh, waveguides, sorry, into, into lithium niobate. This is a sample. Um, and, uh, and then we just look at the, in this experiment, we just looked at the signal beam, which was at 750 nanometers. And we also looked at the pump. And it was extremely efficient. So this uh, plot shows the um, curve that I showed you before, but in the logarithmic scale, this is the number of output photons per pulse versus the input pump power, but this time it's microwatt, so it's three orders of magnitude less. And the gain achieved here, the parametric gain achieved here is 12. Uh, and uh, this, the numbers of photons are, you see, 10 to the 11 and so on. And up to some point, everything develops according to this inch squared dependence. Uh, because in log scale, this is just square root. Since under the cinch squared, we had uh, amplitude of the pump, so square root of the power. So up to this point, it goes as usual. But here something happens, and it's, it's known, actually, it was um, pioneered by, uh, sorry, I don't have the reference, but it was done in the Coma group by Maria Bondi, uh, 
Maria Bondani's group, uh, they saw this pump depletion, but they didn't didn't compare really in real numbers what happens with uh, with uh, Fulton budget, so to say. Um, and we did it now. Uh, so this is uh, the signal beam of parametric down conversion, and these are other effects that also happen. Some frequency generation, second harmonic generation from this signal, a lot of other effects. But you see, there are much weaker, three orders of magnitude weaker than a parametric down conversion. And so we looked at the photon budget, and it was quite nice. So the pump uh, was really depleted, so up up to this point, which corresponded to, to about 100 uh, microwatts mean power. Uh, the output pump was uh, up to loss, up to reflection by the crystal, coinciding with the input pump. So this is the number of photons in the pump at the output, and this is the um, power of the pump and the input. So up to this point, it developed normally, and then suddenly the pump was uh, stuck at, at some value, and all pump power apparently was uh, spent on the generation of the signal photons. So this is the number of signal photons. Here it looks like zero, but it actually it's not zero. It's just a huge num huge scale here to show the number of pump photons. So here the number of uh, signal photons developed exponentially actually is just not se not seen here. And then starting from this point, it starts to 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 increase linearly. And then if you add up the numbers of photons from the pump and from PVC, it coincides, almost coincides with the input number of pump photons. So starting from this pump, uh, point, the pump doesn't, uh, all pump is spent on uh, generating these signal photons and the efficiency of generation was 33% here at only uh, 160 micro watt, which corresponded to about 100 uh, nanojoules per pulse. So this is, uh, yeah, numbers of photons per pulse, you can see very small, very low. And this reminds me of a nice picture I saw in, in this uh, very nice book by Loud on the quantum theory of light, which describes lasing, how the laser works uh, up to uh, some, mm, so uh, as, as the pumping increases, uh, then at first uh, it's just spontaneous emission that develops and then at some point after the threshold uh, the lasing starts and then uh, the spontaneous emission is, is, is stabilized so it's uh, at, at, a, at a fixed uh, value and then the laser output uh, develops linearly uh, with the pumping. So this is very similar to this picture and uh, moreover there is an analogy in the statistics and then next we looked at the statistics of the signal beam and of the pump beam as i said the signal beam has ah uh, mm -hmm, I'm, I'm finishing the signal beam initially has these thermal uh, fluctuations and uh, it is uh, measured by g2 by the second order correlation function here we plot the g2 minus one uh, because there are many modes, it's not uh, it's not one as one one would expect, but it's it's uh, ten to the minus one, and the pump has of course uh, almost coherent statistics, so G two is small, and then um, this happens until this point where we have pump depletion, and after pump depletion, they exchange fluctuations, the twin beams or at least signal beam, which we measured, becomes less noisy, so much quieter, and the pump becomes more noisy. So the noise, uh, the photon number fluctuations uh, migrate from the signal to the pump. And this is also very similar to what happens with the laser. Above the threshold, the initially strong uh, photon number fluctuations caused by, um, by um, uh, spontaneous emission are just uh, suppressed and uh, the statistics becomes coherent. But this analogy is very raw. I, I have to, we have to think about it further. Uh, and I am finishing. Yeah, Josh tells me that I should finish. Um, so I want to thank, before giving my conclusions, I want to thank uh, my group, by, by the way, because uh, some of the ideas were fueled by members of my group. But actually, the experiment was done, uh, all experiments I was showing was done solely by uh, Ottawa students, uh, Sam Lemieux and uh, Jefferson Flores, who is now in Erlangen, and also, of course, uh, Robert Boyd uh, was uh, leading the uh, 
Ottawa uh, group and um, Jeff Landin was uh, leading the work of Jeff and St. Boris and of, of course uh, two, uh, two uh, postdocs were helping Robert Fickler and Enno Giese. Um, so that's always uh, thanks and uh, to conclude. So I think I uh, explained what are the features of bright squeezed vacuum. Uh, and uh, I explained that there are two problems with bright squeezed vacuum, that uh, it requires really huge resources to prepare and it has a strong intensity fluctuations. And then I showed in the last part of my talk, I showed how these resources can be simplified because I think uh, 100 microwatts is easier than, than 100 milliwatts. And uh, then the second part was about the metrology work. So we uh, can calibrate spectrometers and even two different spectrometers, for instance, one measuring signal, one measuring LiDAR, uh, how it's, I think it's a simple way and uh, we use it in the lab uh, every now and then. And I think it's uh, useful. So thank you for your attention. All right, thank you very much, uh, Maria. Um, we have uh, 146 people uh, listening to your talk. Um, there are a lot of questions and not a lot of time if we're gonna stick to schedule, um, but I will, uh, I will pose one to you. Um, so uh, regarding this, this last uh, segment of your talk where you show this kind of threshold action, um, certainly uh, what, what came to mind for me, um, and this is, uh, this is uh, reflected in um, a question from Tim Ralph as well, uh, is something like OPO uh, threshold action. Um, so Tim Ralph uh, asks, maybe you have some reflection somewhere and you have a kind of OPO action going on. Can you comment? Uh, it's not OPO because uh, in OPO the threshold, if I understand correctly, I'm not a specialist in OPO, is, is related with gain and loss. And here, um, the, the, at, actually at any loss, the loss will not matter for this uh, exponential dependence. Uh, whatever loss you have, you will always have the sinh squared dependence. Um, but rather what happens is that uh, you have this effect, uh, the depletion, when a considerable amount of photons is, is just taken from the pump. Uh, and in, in our case, it's really one third. Uh, so it has to do with this dynamics between the pump and uh, the down converted beams. And even I think this dynamics has been described theoretically by, uh, well, there is a paper by Jan Perina uh, from Olomot. It shows the same curve. And then there was some classical description uh, earlier. Uh, so I think that this dependence is, um, the, the threshold-like dependence of the pump is not something new. But new for us is the statistics that the fluctuations really stop at this point or reduce very much. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. As I say, there are lots of questions about technical details and about the kind of metrology uh, perspectives. All of those are going to go over onto the Slack. Um, so uh, I hope you enjoy continuing the discussion over there. Thank you again, Ria.